thanks for coming to Customizing Sphinx, also known as 25 Minutes of Hell. We have a lot to go through. Real quick about me, um, I'm a developer advocate for PyCharm, luckiest guy in the world. I don't know why they pay me. Sometimes I think I should pay them. This is recorded, don't tell them I said that. They may take me up on that offer. And I've done a number of things uh, in Python. This is a different presentation format for me because it actually has information instead of jokes. But as you might notice in the bottom, it has a rather ambitious number. So to paraphrase Raymond from this morning, the fact that there are 67 slides in 25 minutes is unimportant. The fact that you may not learn what's on the slide before I go to the next slide is unimportant. Making you aware of all the alleys and corners in Sphinx, that's what's important. Don't worry about it because there is a repo with the slides and the example material. You will never remember Sphinx. You just need to know where to look. We will start with simple, doing some work on, uh, on Sphinx configuration. But first, I want to know a little bit about the audience, and I have a hidden agenda on this. Raise your hand if you've ever written docs in Sphinx. OK. Um, did I? I wonder if I missed the slide about. Yeah, all right. Raise your hand if you've ever customized a Sphinx site. All right, we just took a little bit, bit of a drop there. Raise your hand if you're a total idiot and you've written a Sphinx extension. Yeah, there we go. Um, I ask these questions, and please come to the PyCharm booth and talk to me about Sphinx afterwards. I want to listen and hear what people want from Sphinx and what they don't want and what the future should be and participate in it a little bit. And so I'd like to hear how people would and wouldn't like to use it. In particular, Sphinx is a static site generation generator. So we'll talk a little bit about Sphinx, the documentation tool, but it can also be a blog tool or a website static site generator. But it is also a platform that you can do wild and crazy things with it, plugging new things in. We will do something simple. We'll just adjust the knobs in the configuration file show you what is possible with that. We'll do something normal. We'll go to the places where you can kind of change the way Sphinx looks by putting special things in special places. That will be the part of the um, journey where we do the always fun, where did that pixel come from in Sphinx explore, exploration. And then we'll do the hard thing, we'll write a Sphinx extension very quickly. A little bit about Sphinx, it is a static site generator. It is old, baby, old. And that's part of the problem is it's layers upon layers upon layers of Python history in it. It is primarily for documentation. It is so great at documentation. Other programming languages besides Python do their thing in Sphinx. There's a, a site, Read the Docs, which is based on Sphinx. It has several ki uh, killer features. I've been doing a lot in Gatsby JS recently. Before that, did Jekyll, did Hugo, I've looked at Pelican, I've looked at Nicola. This whole rich interlinking thing that Sphinx does is a killer feature that none of those others do. It's extensible, but its stack is just crazy and old, and it's something I'm interested in talking with people about to see if there's any energy in addressing that. When I say crazy old, one of the first things that happens in Sphinx is like, oh my god, restructured text, I want to use Markdown. Have you ever thought about how old restructured text is? Have you ever wondered what the re in restructured text is as if it, there was something before that? This is my good buddy Jim Fulton, creator of Zope, in 1996 announcing structured text. For the bleeping record Markdown, we had already created our second generation system before you existed, so suck it. Let's take a look at configuration. We're going to change the configuration values, see the impact in a rendered Sphinx site, and then we're going to change some options in a theme to see how it looks. So for example, I've got a configuration file. I've run Sphinx to generate a skeleton for me. It kindly puts a hello world restructured text doc page. And it makes a configuration file with a whole bunch of friendly comments saying, edit this to get that. For example, the name of the project. Maybe it's Flask under SQL Alchemy or something like that. And if you edit that value, 
you can alter the output. Another option you can do is change where Sphinx looks for your custom static assets like images and uh, CSS. And I'm sure all of you are desperate to create man pages. So the configuration file also gives you knobs for creating man pages and maybe stone tablets. So if your site looks like this, this is what my this site looked like when I ran the Sphinx command, didn't change anything. This is what it looked like in my browser. And if I go and change that to that, I get this. So I've edited a variable in a Python file, rerun a command, and my HTML site now has that on every single page in the site. So that's the, like the simplest customization you can do, edit a value that already exists. Let's go a little bit further. Uh, Sphinx has multiple ways it can generate stuff. It can generate HTML. Same documentation can go to PDF, it can go to EPUB, it can go to little, little man pages. HTML has some special machinery, a concept called theming, and you can supply extra values that are only applicable when you're building HTML. So for example, uh, the default theme is something called Alabaster. I could change it if I wanted to, but I can also go change this dictionary as the comment explains and feed some values to that theme. That theme being Alabaster. If I did a different theme, then I could feed feed different options to that theme. They are theme specific and customized the look and feel. Where do these come from? Uh, here we go. Sphinx HTML theming, a um, subsystem of Sphinx that has some standards defined in different ways. Some of the standards are defined in Python. Some of them are defined in documentation. Some of them are defined in INI files. There's all these little handshake agreements all over the place that archaeologists have been studying for decades. And they're all in different kinds of systems. So what you can do is go to the Sphinx documentation site and they have a page on HTML theming that explains a lot of this for you. In particular, the theme you choose that you've downloaded or you use the default theme or you write your own theme has to advertise to the rest of the world, here are my knobs. It advertises its knobs in a file called a theme.conf file, which lives in the software of the theme. I was talking about Alabaster as a theme. So Alabaster has knobs. It, it documents these knobs in the documentation. So on this site, it tells you about customizing. And it tells you its theme options. But it also has one of these theme.comp files, which is a little bit more of a contract. Instead of words on a page, this is enforced. All of these things on the left-hand side are values you can put in your comp file in that dictionary that said HTML theme options. On the right side are some of these have default values that are used if you don't provide it. So the theme can make some choices for you and allow you to override some things for example, the width of the page. By default, Alabaster will give you a 940 pixel wide page. Where is that actually implemented and enforced? Oh, I'll, I'll get to that later. So for example, if I change the page width to something ridiculous like 340 pixels, I did this by editing that configuration file. Comp.py has a dictionary HTML under theme, under options, which lets you provide all those values, all those knobs that are in the theme.comp file. I change this to a ridiculous value, I get a ridiculous site. Yay, for the win. How does this page under width actually work? Where does Alabaster, it reads it in, where does it write it to? Alabaster has a CSS file. But no, it's not CSS, it's CSS under T. What might the under T mean? It's magic, just like the directory name of static. It's magic, it's the secret handshake that you have to go learn about. If a theme has a directory called static, all of those assets are available and copied into the site. A CSS file is copied into the site unless it ends in underscore T. 
in which case it's pumped through a Jinja 2 template and then rendered to a CSS file, which is delivered statically. So when you run Sphinx build to build your site, it's going to dynamically go get this variable, theme under page under width, which we set to 340 stupid pixels, and it's going to stick 340 stupid pixels in there and then write the CSS file. But you may note, theme under? Wasn't it called just page width? What's up with the theme under? It's part of this secret handshake. There are so many different handshakes, and this is one of them. Instead of using Python dictionaries to break things into little piles, they just add junk to the front of the variable name. So that was me in my beginning of my Sphinx journey. I was like, where the hell is page width? Nowhere! It's theme under page width, dummy. That's what you got to look for. So let's make a mistake. I'm in Alabaster, and I've supplied a knob that doesn't exist. I turn the volume to 11. And when I run Sphinx build, Sphinx build nicely tells me, hey, it's a warning, not an error, so it continues processing. It nicely tells me, hey, dummy, I don't have that knob. So that's actually a pretty good uh, error message. I do not believe it was. Uh, this would not even be Alabaster. This would be the, the, the Sphinx HTML builder. Um, and so I don't remember it being an error instead of a warning, but you might be right. Uh, Sphinx does an excellent job with their change logs. And you could probably go read and see all the like 50 changes they make in each release and see if that's true. That's a good question. Thank you for asking. Actually, do you think it should be an error, or do you think it should continue? I'm of the belief that if you do something wrong, stop. I run an internal read the docs plugin ah. that renders all the docs to the parsing, uh -huh. so that the docs are written to be published like 10 repositories. Got it. So not patching when I find an undefined uh, change is something I, I, I had a long patch around a long time ago. I have to wait. It sounds like you agree with me, so two thumbs up for me. Because you'll never see it, stuff will stream by, you know, maybe you'll see at the bottom that there are warnings. Summary of simple. <laughs> Gotta speed up. Summary of simple, you can edit files to affect knobs, regenerate, and see the changes in output. And I should talk to you about some handshakes, secret handshakes. <laughs> because bleep's getting real. Customizing. Let's talk about the, the game of where did that pixel come from. We're going to override a template, we're going to add some CSS, and then we're going to install a third-party package and extension that happens to be a thing. And talk about each of those three cases of customizing. This is still painting within the lines, so to speak. So let's say this is out of the box, and let's say where that yellow is, I want to put a little paragraph just after that explaining how to use search. Not Rocket science, you know? I just want to add something. It just gets weird. And why does it get weird? Because there are so many little architectures and abstractions and indirections that have accumulated over the years to help you. And we will have to follow the breadcrumb trail to get to that. Remember that Sphinx can generate PDF, but in its HTML system, it's got a whole bunch of machinery to customize things. And it has machinery, but more importantly, Jinja 2, the templating engine that Sphinx uses, has multiple ways to decompose things that Sphinx then adds a layer to it. So for example, when I add something that appears on every page, I'll go to the Alabaster master layout. Pretty good place to start, right? This is the one page that rules them all. Oh, wait, it doesn't. Because it actually is a it the master template is actually a child of the other master template. It's kind of like marriage. Um, and so the HTML, the basic theme that ships in Sphinx under Sphinx themes basic has layout.html which defines the page structure that all Sphinx everything is supposed to adhere to. I've got something over here called sidebar that you can shove stuff in. It's not sidebars, it's sidebar. And so all these names and structures. So I'll go down a little bit, and here's where 
con where Sphinx lets you put stuff into its block called content. I'm sorry, Alabaster lets you put something into its block called content. You're like, oh, cool. That no, because what it did was it said if theme under five, well, that what that line is maybe 15 years old, so it's never true. So that's the thing that's true. And what it's saying is, okay, when that other thing that's never true is false, meaning always, go to the, go to dad and get or go to mom, go to mom super and run its uh, content block. Okay, I'll go over to basic layout.html, find the content block, whack a mole. Here we go. Okay, now we're talking. This is inside the content block of core Sphinx basic theme. And it's got a block called sidebar two that then does this other thing. It calls it a, a, a Jinja tube macro. Not a block, but a macro. So sidebar parens, let's go find that. The sidebar macro, in this case, is actually defined in basic layout.html. Usually Jinja tube macros are in a file called macros that you pull in. This one's inline, so hey, getting close, right? Getting close? You're not getting close. You can't even see it from here. So this is the macro. If render under sidebar, we'll get in. Okay, now we get into some fun stuff. This is where we look to see if there are any sidebars in this site. Notice the line above. Pro tip, don't name your product ng, because 10 years later, that'll seem stupid. Don't put a line of code in saying, this is the new style that is probably 15 years old. But kudos to them for supporting old style blocks forever and ever. So the thing I'm looking for, that sidebar in the side that has quick search, I'm going to loop, it, it's saying that it's looping over a Python list called sidebars. Where did sidebars come from? Hmm. Oh, well, maybe the documentation will help me. In fact, it does. Sphinx documentation says that HTML theming has a first class idea called HTML under sidebars. But wait, didn't it say sidebars? It didn't say HTML sidebars, right? More handshake magic. Some things have magical theme under in front of it. Some of them have magical HTML under in front of it. So this is one of those. In your comp file, you can define a list. I've got it circled there. A list of Jinja 2 templates, which are available for use in the sidebar. And you can change those, a theme can add to those, everybody can add to those. So searchbox.html, now I found the thing I want. It is in uh, Sphinx basic uh, searchbox.html. Sphinx has a mechanism where if you have a file with the exact same name as something in the core, but you have it in your site, it will use your thing instead of its thing. So to replace search, mod search box .html, I just need a file in under templates. It's a magical directory like under static. And this becomes the first place looked by Sphinx. I cut and paste everything in there, and then I add my paragraph, rebuild my site. Yay, woo! I've added a line of text to my site. That was a little bit challenging. Because all this magic in multiple different magical structures is hard to deal with. And as a Python person, explicit is better than implicit, except for all of that. And so I aspire to a future of Sphinx that is more explicit than uh, implicit. These informal handshakes drive me crazy. Let's add some CSS so we can make that text green. I made the HTML node say class uh, equals search on dash help. If I make a specially named file in a specially named directory, custom.css in underscore static, I can put in CSS, which will generate a link tag in the head of every one of my HTML pages. So I can customize the CSS that will override any other CSS. And now I've got green help. But wait, there's more. What if I want it to be pink? I can change the name to CSS under T as the file extension. 
and it'll run it through Jinja 2, and it will go get the pink under one value from the current themes, theme.conf, or your setting in the conf.py file. And it will replace that variable with the color code defined as pink. Now we have pink. One last theme, uh, thing under simple. We're going to install an extension, a Python package, which adds new capabilities to Sphinx written by someone else. In this case, I'm going to add a theme called Bootstrap. So I'm going to pip install that package. Just because the package is in my virtual environment doesn't mean it's used. I have to go tell Sphinx, hey, there's a Sphinx extension over there. And I do that by editing, um, well, first, including the extension and saying that that is my theme. And now my uh, theme looks, my site looks different because I've switched to a different theme. Lots of extensions. This is the, one of the fun parts of Sphinx. Can do magical things. You can make new directives to have custom widgets. You can replace the HTML builder with something that builds, I don't know, uh, AMP files or something like that. Uh, React Native. You can make a React Native builder. Or your own crazy thing, which I've spent the last two summers working on. Now, the hard part, extending. I want to do, I want to make something real and substantive that I can ship to other people and they can use in their Sphinx site. What is a Sphinx extension? It's a Python package. Yay! So you can just distribute it with pip. It's a Python package with a function named setup at the top of the package. So that when someone in their comp file says, here's an extension, it'll run that function. When Sphinx runs you, it passes itself to you. So the setup function will take an argument for the app. From that point forward, you can interact with the Sphinx platform by registering all kinds of things. So for example, this is the setup function for Alabaster. Alabaster is an extension that provides a thing. It's past the app. It does this sniff to see if it's old Sphinx. And then it, does, it provides this function called update context, which shoves new variables into the Jinja 2 uh, rendering. All right. We're going to add a to-do system to Sphinx. Oh, sorry. No. This is what Sphinx docs give you a very good tutorial on writing a simple extension that provides a little to-do database in restructured text. So let's write an extension. It's just going to print hello world, of course. It's going to do several things. Sphinx takes all of your content, puts it in this neutral representation that can then spew PDF, HTML, man pages, stone tablets. Those, that thing is called docutils. Docutils is an ancient system for Python. It's on SourceForge. Um, it was down for a month and no one noticed but me. Seriously. Uh, and in addition to a node, we need a directive, which is a thing your users will type in the middle of their document to generate a hello world thing. And then finally, we need an event handler to connect the dots between all of those things. So here we go. We're going to write a Sphinx extension. Two minutes. First thing I need is a docutils node. I'm going to inherit from existing nodes so I don't have much work to do. And I'm going to define a function that when I enter that node and when I exit that node, I'm going to do these units of work. Again, I'm going to take advantage of built-in stuff. So I now have the possibility to have a hello world node. Now I need to make this available in restructured text with a directive. So this is the hello world directive, and it makes a hello world node, and then puts it into this crazy state tree thing and returns. So we now have a directive. Then finally, we need to teach Sphinx when it's walking through all the documents and it stumbles across one of these nodes, generate some output. I'm cheating. I'm generating HTML directly instead of that intermediate representation. So this would look stupid in PDF, but we don't care for right now. When, when this function runs, when it stumbles across a hello world node, it's going to generate italics. Wire all this stuff together in a setup function that adds a directive, uh, adds a handler. Then distribute it to people. People pip install my package, 
and they add it to the extensions, which tells Sphinx to go run my setup.py. And they can sit in their documentation now and do this all over the place. And I've added a new word to Sphinx, a new directive, a new command. And when we render, we get hello world. Uh, very briefly, when I do HTML and React development, I hate type reload browser, type reload browser. I want to stay in one place. When I do Sphinx extension development, I hate type rerun Sphinx, go to browser reload, type reload. So I do everything in test-driven development. Um, it just makes it so much easier. Sphinx provides a PyTest fixture that makes this dead simple to rerun a sample Sphinx, Sphinx site as you're doing your development. And this is what a test would look like. It takes the HTML that's rendered and makes some assertions to see if Hello World is actually in the HTML. This is how I develop. It's so awesome. I just sit in my IDE, run tests, and things go green, and I go, yay, my Sphinx works. Best word in any presentation, in conclusion, please come talk to me about Sphinx. I want to find out what people do and don't care about. Sphinx is big. It's powerful in ways that people don't know about. It's kind of, um, it needs a little fixing, fixer upper on some of its machinery to make it more friendly for the modern web. I feel like it's underappreciated as one of Python's secret weapons. That's it. Do we have time for questions? Yes, we have five minutes for questions. Five minutes for questions. I think about a lot about like new documentation because I I get calls from people like oh you know my mom's just shit or something like that. Truer words were never spoken. It's not that it's not a great tool, it's just that um again the use of the things that have you know for what are like useful for the rest of the context that you might not be aware of. True. Uh, totally agree with you. Oh, sorry, yes. Um, how do we get Sphinx to the point where it's competitive with other static site generators such as Jekyll and also what other tools are there that are comparable to that? I say, I make the distinction there because Jekyll don't do that. Jekyll does not look at your Python code's doc strings and arguments and generate documentation of your Python code. It just generates pages from Markdown. Uh, Jekyll and Hugo and everything not named Sphinx will not tell you if you've linked to something that doesn't exist. It will not let you link to something and take the title from that thing and make it the link text over here, for example. So it has some richness from a documentation perspective and interlinking perspective that the other ones don't do. On your bigger question, damn, that's exactly what I spent my last two summers of vacation coding doing. Um, I'm deeply interested in not using Gatsby JS anymore, or Jekyll or Hugo, and making Sphinx competitive both from a modern web, offline first, but also what, sh what you were mentioning about um, lower the barrier to entry. I just don't know if anybody gives a damn. Seriously. I, a lot of people are like, just generate some docs. I'll go use something non-Python when I want to be sexy. Does anybody give a damn? <laughs> right here. All right, all right. Did you have your? Okay. Uh, um, I have I have a whole bunch of questions, um, but maybe the one I'll focus on is one of the things I think that screws people up uh, in terms of Sphinx adoption is the layers problem that you yep. mentioned. So the idea that like. Our RST is not really Sphinx's thing. RST is Docking Field's thing. Correct. Is, is, 
is that uh, and and driving adoption of writing RSP is difficult when you're charging a you're, non Python you're right. for instance. So things like is DocuTil dead as a project? Is does that concern sync as a project? Um, I personally support Markdown in the sync sites that my users yep. use with a variety of hacky methods, and it seems like more and more they're sort of Markdown to DocuTil bridge. Yep. Markdown is absolutely inferior to RSP and it doesn't support as many semantic concepts. Um, or extensions, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff there, but like, is the future of, of sync uh, tied tightly to RSP and DocuTil? Very good question. If it is, we're screwed. Uh, the war's over. Restructure text lost. Uh, as he mentioned, to repeat the question, um, the underpinnings, in particular markdown versus restructured text, could be holding Sphinx back. What is actually going on there and what could be a path forward? As you mentioned, Eric from Read the Docs has a package called Recommon Mark that is a bridge to let you do a little bit of Sphinx stuff in markdown in a Sphinx site, but it doesn't expose all the semantics because markdown doesn't have all the semantics. I, the, a couple months ago at EuroPython, I went to go investigate DocuTil's state of the art, hoping it was dead. It's not that dead. The people still care about it. They actually said, why would we move to GitHub? We're happy with SourceForge. Um, but I could imagine a future where restructured text didn't change, it just changed the symbols used to match the symbols in Markdown. And it was still a DocuTils processor with an alternate format. Because that's what people, they, they want, they don't want underlines, they want double hashtag for headings and the link syntax and some of those other things. Uh, Recommon, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've thought of some clever names, yeah. It's Phoenix. Um, the, uh, but that project needs love because uh, Markdown is painful to implement. And, and a follow-up to that, um, I'm also a, uh, I've collected text. Just like let me close out that one. You can write on Read the Docs right now, you can write stuff in Markdown. And in Sphinx, you can install that thing and do a reasonable amount of stuff in Markdown. Go ahead. Um, is, is it might be also I was I was going to answer that it's as dead. yeah Ruby his pick yeah. Like yeah. Really um, people wanting to write books um, I know a very prominent Python person yesterday told me he switched for an O'Reilly book from Sphinx to ASCII doc okay there you go other questions. Nope. It is very active. Uh, I don't know if the GitHub is a mirror of a bit bucket or if they made the switch completely. Um, there's a Google group that is very active with people asking questions. There is a, a lot of easy to do stuff that you could participate in. Um, it would be a great project to, to contribute to. And the second part is, um, at least in my company, like we you know, we went through all that. I'm like, I'm still getting PTSD from all that stuff you mentioned. And like, we got it to run, set up. There's a Jenkins job that updates the doc. Oh, yeah. Nobody reads the doc. Do you have any tips <laughs> on, on how to kind of encourage people to contribute and like just read them? Like, just like think of them as the main source of information. And then if they can't find something there, they can ask the developer, or they can ask on Slack or something like that. No good suggestions on that. Um, <laughs> That's okay. There you go. Sorry. Uh, we we'll we'll uh, we'll go out in the hall and come see me in the booth. So.